a stranger in the mist. Jules Hampton was spending a short holiday in Wales. A friend of his had recently sold his business in Liverpool and had moved to Wales. This friend, whose name was Verley, had built himself a house in Kona, Bonshire, near the Snowdon Mountains. There was an ancient church called uh, Fablenfall, Fall, a few hundred yards away from his house, so Verley called his new house Fablenfall too. Tills was very interested in geology. He loved studying rocks and stones. Since that part of Wales is, a, is of a particular interest to the geologists, Dills was very glad indeed to receive Verley's invitation to visit him. Tills arrived at Fablen Fall on the evening of October 10. The house was very modern and extremely comfortable. It stood between the mountains and the Con Conway Valley. A few hundred yards behind the house lay the, uh, the steep, rocky mountains. The weather was fine and for the first week of his stay, Gilles went with Verley on several short geological expeditions. They also went shooting together once or twice, and they visited neighbors in the district. But on October 18th, Verley had business in the local market town. So Gilles decided to make an all-day excursion to a place on the other side of the mountains, about ten miles away. The sky was cloudy when Jill set off after an early breakfast. In his bag were his sandwiches and his geological hammers and information from Burley's servant, Parry, about his route across the mountains. It was after 12 o'clock when Jill arrived, arrived and began unpacking his hammers. The sun had come out and he was hot, tired and uncomfortable, but he soon forgot his discomfort when he examined the many interesting rocks. It was half past three before he had finished. He packed his hammers and notebook away in his bag again and started on the journey back to Fathom Fur. By this time the sky was cloudy again. As he walked along, l light rain began to fall. Then, as he climbed higher, a thick damp mist came down and covered everything. Soon, the mist grew thicker, and he could see only a few feet in front of him. On his earlier journey across the mountains, Jules had looked out for landmarks, a waterfall, an old tree, a small lake. He thought this would help him to find his way back to Fablon Fall. But in the mist, everything looked strange and different. Soon, he crossed a stream, he crossed a stream which he not recognized. Then he knew that he had taken the wrong path. For nearly half a mile he went back the way he had come, only to become more lost and confused than before. This is no good, he thought. He sat down for a few moments to consider his position. The sort of cold, uncomfortable night along, alone on the hillside did not particularly worry him, but he knew the Verley would be very anxious. Gilles did not want to worry his friend. He'll come out to search for me, thought Gilles, and bring the neighbors too. I can let him organize a search party. I, I really can't. Suddenly, he heard the sound of footsteps on the hillside above him. He shouted, and a voice and answered him in Welsh. From out of the mist came an old man with a huge dog by his side. Although the man was old, he stood straight and tall. He wore a heavy cloak of dark cloth that came down to his ankles. He wore no hat and his hair was long and white. His big red face shone with kindness. The old man spoke again in Welsh. Gilles made signs to show that he did not understand. The old man smiled kindly. I'm lost, said Gilles, making more signs. I want to go to Fabio Four. Then he felt inside his long cloak and pulled out a map. He spread the map out on a stone in front of him. Burley's new house was not, of course, on the map, but the turret of Fabian Four was clearly shown. With his thin old hand, the stranger pointed to a place on the map. He spoke again in Welsh, then pointed again. He's telling me that we are here, said Gilles to himself. 
Then he, then the old man pointed out the path that Jesus must take to reach Fallen Fall. He did this three times to make sure that Jesus understood. Then he pushed the map into Jesus' hands. Jesus tried to refuse this gift, but the old man only laughed and smiled. Jesus thanked him warmly and pushed the map into this, uh, into his coat pocket. Then he set out along the path that the old man had shown him. After a few steps he turned. He saw a shape through the mist, standing and watching him. He waved his hand and set off again. The next time he turned around, the old man had disappeared. Jills walked fast. The mist had become thicker than before, but the path was a good one. From time to time, he checked his route on the map. Soon the path led him down a very steep hillside. In the mist, Jills could see only a few feet ahead, so he moved very carefully. Suddenly, his foot turned on a sharp stone and he almost fell. That stone probably saved his life. It flew up from under his feet and rolled down the steep path. He heard it rolling faster and faster, then the noise stopped. A few seconds later, Jules heard a crash as the stone hit the ground hundreds of feet below. The path had led him to the edge of a cliff. Jules picked up another stone and dropped it. Again, he heard a distant crash as it fell over the cliff. He looked at the map again. There was no cliff on the rope that, he, that the old man had shown him. For the first time, Jules became seriously worried. He sat down miserably, miserably on, a rock, on a large rock, took out his pipe and found a match to light it. Well, he thought, I'll just have to sit and wait for the mist to clear. Perhaps it was an hour later when he heard a, no a voice shouting on the hillside below. Jill shouted back as loudly as he could. Slowly, the shouts got nearer. He recognized the voice of early servant, Perry, who had become anxious about Jill's safety and had set out to, to search for him. Burley himself had not returned from the town. Jill, Jill was extremely grateful for this. He hated to trouble his friend. Parry led Jill safely back towards the house. Jill walked slowly and quietly, thankful to be rescued. But for some reason, he was unwilling to tell Parry about the stranger in the mist. He explained that he had taken the wrong path. In less than an hour, he was changing his sweat clothes. At dinner, too, he kept quiet about it, simply telling Burley that he had lost his way in the mist. I suppose I took the wrong path, he said, and I found myself at the edge of a cliff. You had a very lucky escape, said Burley. There had been some na nasty accident in these hills. A man was killed about four years ago. I believe he was found at the bottom of the same cliff. That was before I came here, of course. He turned to his servant. I'm sure you remember the accident, Perry, he said. Am I right? Was it the same place? It certainly was, sir, said the servant. It was a gentleman from London. They buried him in the churchyard here. I was working for Captain Trevor at the time. He let us all go to the burial. Mr. Roberts buried him and prayed over the grave. It was all in the local newspaper. I kept the newspaper. It was a carnivore and district years. I'll, f I'll fetch it if you liked it, sir. That's a good idea, Parry, said his master. In a few minutes, Parry re returned with an old paper, newspaper. Burley read the report aloud. Early on Wednesday morning, the... Early on Wednesday morning, the body of a young man was found at the bottom of a cliff. At Idrieren, a doctor examined the body and decided that the man had been dead for several hours. The unfortunate man was Mr. John Stevenson, a young lawyer from London.
Mr. Stevenson had been on holiday in Wales and he had been exploring our beautiful mountains and valleys. When he did not return to his hotel in the evening, Captain Trevor, a local man, bravely organized a search party. Unfortunately, the thick, the thick mist made their work more difficult. It appears that the dead man took the wrong path in the mist and fell over, over the cliff, hitting the sharp rocks below. In the dead man's pocket was a copy of a very old, out-of-date map. It showed a long, disused path over the hill. Of course, as everyone in the district knows, the path was destroyed many years ago by the great landslide. There was a terrible disaster which carried away a large part of the hillside. The sad death of Mr. Stevenson should be a warning to everyone. Never depend on an out-of-date map. A modern, accurate map of the district is available from the offices of his newspaper, Price Nine Pence. When Giles heard about the out-of-date map in the dead man's pocket, he was very excited. He told Beverly the whole story of the stranger in the mist. Beverly was very interested. Do you remember anything about the map, Parry? He asked his servant. I certainly do, sir, said Parry. It was a very old map. Mr. Robert still has it, I believe. Then I will... Then, will you please send a message to Mr. Rover for me, said Beverly. Give him my best wishes and ask him to come and have coffee with us. And ask him to bring the old map with him, please. Parry hurried away to carry out his master's orders. I have the map that the old man gave me today, said Giles. It is still in my coat pocket. I'll go and get it. He fetched the map and spread it out on the table. The two men studied it carefully. In the mist, Giles had not noticed anything strange about the map. But in the brightly lit dining room, the map looked very unusual indeed. It was on thick paper that looked yellow with age. The writing was very old with slows that looked like F's. With long S's that looked like F's. That's the way we have to say it. Look at that, said Verley, Ber pointing to some writing at the bottom of the map. Madog as Reeves, 1707. Just then, Mr. Robert, uh, Mr. Robert arrived. He listened carefully to Jill's story. Then he took a map. Then he took a map out of his pocket. It was exactly like the map that lay on the table. I've always wondered how the man... How the dead man got the map, he said, is very unusual. There's only one other copy, and that's in the museum in Carnival. Uh, who was Madog Abrace? asked Giles. He was a rather strange, lonely old man, said Mr. Mr. Roberts. He lived alone on the hillside and spent most of his time praying. He died in 1720. Of course, it was before the landslide destroyed the path to Adir Iron. When ever there was a mist, Madag Abris walked among the hills in his long dark cloak with his dog beside him. He drew his map. He always carried a copy about with him to give to travelers who had lost their way. Some local people say that his spirit still walks among the hills searching for lost travelers. But that's only a story. I don't take it very seriously. How sad, says, said Giles, after Mr. Roberts had drunk his coffee and left. Madagab Rips was a good, kind man. He only wanted to help, but he led poor Stevenson to his death. And he almost killed me. And that's the end of the story.